Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Tonight we continue on with verse number 109, which reads, Abhivadanasilisa nichang vadha pachayino jataro dhamma vadanti ayupvanno sukhang palang. Which means, Abhivadanasilisa, for one who is of a manner or who has as their behavior, their character, um, respect or the attitude of paying reverence, who is by nature reverential. Uddha Pachayino, um, bowing down or yeah, bowing down to those who are buddha, which could mean people who are old or people who are senior, bowing down to their seniors or to people who are who are worthy of their respect in some way or another. Chattaro dhamma vadanti, four dhammas in Greece for that person. Ayu, long life, vana, vano, um, health, sukhang, happiness, balang, strength. So this is a probably the most famous, the most well-known of the Dhammapada verses among Buddhists, um, among Theravada Buddhists. Why? Because it's most it's it's used in in. I think every one of the Theravada countries as a blessing, as kind of a reminder of the blessing uh, when people do pay respect. So when there are ceremonies and people come and pay respect to the monks and offer food to the monks, the monks give us a blessing, this verse. So you might hear it if you go to a Buddhist monastery at the very end of their blessings, whether it be Sri Lankan or Thai or I'm not sure about Burmese, but I'm, I imagine certainly Laos, Cambodia, all these countries, it's used as a blessing. So it's not a blessing, it's not saying may you have these things, it's just reminding you or, or pointing out the fact that the Buddha taught that these things increase when people are reverential, respectful. So respect is, is considered a good thing. Respect is considered to be, um, as we've seen in the past few verses, this is actually the only reason this verse belongs in this chapter, which is actually the chapter on thousands. So everything in this verse should be about a thousand this, a thousand that, or a many number of things. It actually go, it's that it goes with the verse, the verses before, which we're talking about abhiwadana, when someone pays pays reverence to those who are respectful, to those who are worthy of respect. Um, it's a great thing, is what they were saying. So this one is saying that four things increase. This was told in regards to uh, a boy. When the Buddha was dwelling in an Aranya Kuti, a place in the, a Kuti in the forest, a hut in the forest, near a town called Digalangika. I have no idea where that is in reference to a young boy who was named Digayu. Diga means long and Ayu means life. Digayu. That was his name. Now, I don't think it was his name when he was born. In fact, well, the story goes there were two Brahmins and they left the home life and um, I think before they were married, so these were young men who decided to live their lives as ascetics, not Buddhist ascetics, but they lived off in the forest doing austerities, torturing themselves, that kind of thing, doing the various religious practices outside of the Buddhist teaching for 48 years. And then one day, one of the Brahmins, one of the friends, these two friends, uh, re decided or realized or somehow found found it 
somehow important through in his meditations living in the forest, he somehow decided that uh, it was important that he continue his line, his lineage. It, it was a it somehow became an important thing for him, although you got to cynically wonder whether it was just an excuse, because it's easy to come up with excuses to, to leave the religious life. And you'll always hear these when people want to disrobe. Uh, they'll have lots of reasons, this or that. The, one of the funniest reasons is when people say, uh, I haven't experienced many things in the world, so I've never gotten drunk, I've never had a girlfriend, and I don't feel like I can fully appreciate the religious life until I go and do those things. A very slippery sort of argument, but it's an excuse. It's certainly not the real reason. So I wonder whether this was actually the real reason, or if, if whatever um, you know, it was maybe the, the activities involved surrounding the uh, furthering of one's line that he was maybe more interested in. Anyway, he got married and he had a boy, and. When the boy was born, he immediately brought him to the other Brahmin, who was still an ascetic, because he he wanted to, to get him to bless, uh, he wanted to get his blessing. And the Brahmin, they came forward to the Brahmin, and he saluted, the father saluted uh, his old friend. At which point he said, the the ascetic said, "May you live long." The Okay. May, you, may you live long, may you live a long life. And then the mother paid respect and he said to her the same thing. May you, be, may you live a long, may you live long. And then they brought the, the boy and they uh, introduced him to the ascetic. And the ascetic was silent. He didn't say anything. And so the, the friend was a little bit disgruntled at this, and so he asks him, he asks him, you know, why, why is it that you, you bless us, but you won't bless our boy? And he said, well, you no, know, uh, thing is, something's going to happen to your boy. So this guy, I guess he had some kind of magical, spiritual insight powers that allowed him to uh, see some danger. And so this was a common thing that people claimed to be able to do in India. Even today, you know, astrologers, yeah, astrologers claim to be able to read people's futures, that kind of thing. Not just in the stars, but they'll do it in other ways, to be able to see people's auras or see their futures, that kind of thing. So he claimed this, and his Brahmin friend got, got quite scared, and, and knowing this was his friend, there was no reason for him to trick him or, or try and deceive him. So he said, is there anything you can do? What, do you know what I can do to, to stop this? Uh, he, sa he, he says some danger, and the man says, what, what sort of danger? He says, he's only going to live a short time. And the man says, how long? He says, seven days. Your boy is only going to live seven days. That's his future. And the Brahmin gets scared, and he says, is there anything I can do? And he, I, I don't know. Well, is there someone who does know? And of course, this looks like a job for her. He says, well, you know, there's that ascetic Gotama, and he does know a lot. He, everyone's always praising him for his knowledge and his ability to teach people the right way to practice. So maybe you could go ask him. So indeed, he takes his son to go and see the Buddha and pays respect. The Buddha says the same thing. Hohi, may you live a long life, and same to the, the mother. They bring the baby forward, same thing, he doesn't say anything. And so again, he asks him the question, what can I do? Is there something I can do? Yeah, there's something you can do. Ah, what, do I, what should I do? And here's the Buddha's cure for, for short life. He says, what you can do is you can set up a pavilion at your house, uh, with eight chairs or sixteen seats, eight or sixteen, he gives them an option, and he says, and invite my disciples to come uh, and chant for seven days. They're going to do protect protective chanting, means they'll chant the teachings of the Buddha, uh, and 
do that for seven days. And that will resolve your problem. That will, that will save your, your son. And said, well, okay, I can, I can set up a pavilion, but how do I get your monks to come? Buddha said, if you set it up, we will come. If you build it, we will come. And so he does that. He sets up this pavilion, sets up these seats, and invites people to come and listen. And for seven days, indeed, non-stop, so the monks would take shifts, they did chanting for this Brahmin, and the Brahmin fed them and uh, gave gifts to each of the monks, I guess, you know, to kind of thank them for their... I mean, it becomes a bit of a... I don't know if that's fair to say, because I don't think it even says that he gave them gifts, but it's an interesting sort of setup, because you wonder, why did the monks go through all that trouble? You know, but um, I suppose one thing you could say is that perhaps it was... Uh, an opportunity to teach the Dhamma, because many people would come and listen, because he set up a pavilion in a public place. And so, what they, and another thing, sorry, is that they would, they set the baby up in a crib or in a seat in the middle of the monks, so with the monks surrounding them. And yeah, so at first, first glance you might think, well, why, why, why were the monks spending seven days doing this? But the the fact is that not only did humans come and listen, angels came and listened as well. It became a huge event. It's kind of like the show of the the show of the century or something. Every all the humans and angels and, and everybody who was anybody came to listen to this event. So that was what the the Buddha prescribed. He said, you know, you have to do something big. You have to do some big good deed. And that, and this is the good deed. Have the recitation of the Dhamma, allow for this teaching of the Dhamma to go on for seven days, and set it up, facilitate this. And so the Buddha got the monks to go and teach the Dhamma for seven days, chanting it, reciting it, for seven days. And of course they would understand it, and it was all a teaching, right? Now, here's the thing, you see. It, it sounds kind of superstitious, of course. It sounds strange that they should be able to predict um, the future, first of all. And then it sounds kind of, I'm, I'm thinking of from a secular point of view, and then it sounds kind of odd that, you know, kind of suspicious that this, um, there's somehow a relationship. You know, why is it that for seven, that this is going to avert his death? You know, it's Maybe it's good to listen to good things and it makes you feel better, but here we've got this seven-year-old, or this day-old child, or this newborn child. What's it, what good's it going to do to him? You know, do these things really provide protection? Is there some magic involved that they protect you from death, so death can't come near? And the funny thing is, which makes this a very Buddhist story, is that there is a reason behind it. The only really superstitious or non-secular, or kind of thing that most skeptics would have a serious problem with, is the, uh, the problem of angels. Because it's actually a story about angels, this story. The story goes that there was a yaka, which is like a demon, or kind of, like some kind of demigod or something, some kind of weird angel who actually uh, is not very nice. And he did something for one of the angels. You know, there's all this politics and favor, favoring and gifting and that kind of thing. So he was owed a favor by one of the god, the angels. One of these angels who, uh, I don't know, some angel. What's the, I don't know, we see. Uh, Vesavana, yeah. Vesavana was, um, I think he was the architect for Saka or something. I don't know. It was some part of the angel hierarchy. And the, the Yaka was named Ava Rudaka for people who are interested in such things. But the deal went that he owed this guy a favor, and so he said, Well, then uh, I'll look the other way and we'll pick a, new, a baby for you to eat. That's how the story goes. And so they picked this baby, 
and this baby was supposed to be the sacrifice. I don't know the details of it. It sounds horrific and you know, just uh, befuddling as to what was really going on there, what was going on behind the scenes. But somehow this was an agreement that was made. You, know, that you get this child. How, how he, this angel had authority over the child, I don't know. It was kind of like a look the other way thing because he owed him, he owed this yaka a favor. That's the story. Um, and so he said, "You got seven days. This is the deal. You, I'll turn my turn my back for seven days. Look the other way, and you 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 can eat the child." So they really didn't protect him. You see, because when when they. Uh, when they brought the monks in, all the angels crowded in. Saka and, and, and all the other, all the angels who were anybody, anybody who was anybody, came to listen. And so there was absolutely no chance that this og, this yaka, could get anywhere near them. He, he apparently had, he, there was so, there was such a hierarchy that he had to go, he had to back up. And the closest he could get to the boy was something like 16 leagues. Twelve leagues. He had to step back twelve leagues. And that was as close as he could get to the pavilion. And so for seven days the monks did this chanting, and on the seventh day the Buddha came. Walked in, sat down in a seat prepared for him and spent all night teaching the Dhamma, taking his turn. And when the sun rose on the eighth day, he turned to the child and he said, May you live long. And they asked him how long he's going to live, and the Buddha said he's going to live 120 years. So they gave him the name Digayuka, or Digayu, as a I oh, know they gave him. It says here they gave him the name Ayuvadana. Hmm. They gave him the name Ayuvadana, which means one whose life increases. Vadana, hmm. increasing. So that's the story. And then, as it as it is said, the monks were hanging out in the Dhammasala one day, talking discussing and they said it's amazing you know that this kid who was going to live seven days and that was somehow his karma there was some something going on there that was uh, as a result of sorry I shouldn't say that was his karma that was his that was some result of some deeds that had been done in the past so it's strange that suddenly that changed and Buddha walked and they, they thought to himself they said you know wonder what the thing is, what is it that uh, changes this, that allows people, what is it that increases people's life, what is it that, that truly, uh, what Dhamma is it, or what sort of Dhammas allow for the increase, for one's lifespan to increase in this way, what's the mechanism? And the Buddha walked in and asked them what they were talking about and they told him, and the Buddha said, monks, for one who is respectful constantly, who is of a nature, of a nature to constantly, nitsyang, ever, to ever be respectful and bow down, you know, to, to, to bend down, you know, this, this idea of bending down in the sense of not being lording over or saying I'm your equal and I don't have to pay respect to anyone and so on. A person who is able to respect others, is able to look up to others and accept that other people might be able to uh, help them or might be worthy of their respect, I think. Such a person for the Buddha said four things increase, not just not just life, but four things increase. And then he told he taught this verse. Chattaro dhamma vadanti ayu, life vana health, sukhang ayu vano, sukhang happiness, balang strength. So that's the verse. Again, not um, directly related to our practice, 
more related to mind states, but a lot of these are. And as a result, are very much a part of our practice because respect, humility, these things are all a part of our practice. I had an interesting experience today that, that kind of relates to this potentially. It made me wonder, you know. Um, I, was, I was teaching meditation today to a new group of people and uh, one of the meditators, we, normally you have people say the words out loud because I want them to want to see that they're doing it correctly. So I say, okay, say it loudly with me. Stepping right, stepping left. And I w watched them. I went to one by one by one to see if they're doing it correctly. And I came up to this one and I said, and she wasn't saying it out loud. And I said, can you say it out loud for me? She said, no. <laughs> I, said, I said, oh, well, I think I said, like, why not? And, and she said, I don't want to. And it made me think, you know, I mean, should you, should you say something, should, should there be, well, it made me think that in, in certain cases that could be really a problem for the person. If they're really not, if they really don't have that faculty that is respectful, you know, when your teacher tells you to do something, it's uh, to just say no to them. Why? Because it's oblivious. If you say, I'm sorry, or if you, you know, if you're respectful, because this person has come to teach you, and you know, I wasn't getting paid or anything, I wasn't a client, uh, so it made me think. But I don't think that's what it was about. Um, I, I'm, I'm really not sure what it was about. But you know, people are have their issues, um, and sometimes those issues are you know, it's not disrespect all the time. I don't think it was sincerely disrespect, but. In most cases, there is a there's a sense there, and I've seen this before, where there's just this switch that hasn't turned on. Like, oh yes, right, I should respect this person because they are teaching me something new, something that I don't know. They have something over me. You see, I mean, it's it's not like lording over, but it's someone you should look up to. Is someone who has knowledge that you don't have. You, know, you that's a something that you should be respectful for, because they don't have to give it to you. They're giving it to you out of kindness and so on. Anyway, there's this, this is a tradition, and I think in the West there's real attitude about this. And I'm not saying on this case it was, but in certain cases where people have this attitude of, not that you have to bow down or something like that, but just um, don't, get, don't get this that if a teacher tells you to do something, you don't have to do it. You can say, I'm sorry, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. But there should be some sense of respect and saying an apology, you know. I, I mean, I think. I think in the West we're, we're, less, we're less, we less have that. But I don't know, having lived in Asia for so long maybe, or being a meditator, I can't help but even my, even my teachers at school um, as I said before, one of my professors, he, the guy before him, leaves chalk dust all over his desk, and he comes in and uh, he puts his, his MacBook down on the table, and it gets all the chalk dust in it, and it ruined his computer at one point. So since then, I've gone and I've wiped down the table before class. I mean, and it just seems like, of course I would do that. I mean, that's something that we do because this person is, is teaching us. This is something, you know. We do it for our parents, because, you know, our respect for them. For most of us, our parents are worthy of respect, and sometimes we don't give them the respect they're, they're, they are worthy of. You know? some, some maybe aren't. I know there are parents who aren't really worthy of much respect, but for the most part they are. So it is in some sense a part of our meditation, in terms of being a mind state that is important. It provides worldly, um, worldly benefits, but it also provides a great, it's a, it's a necessary, sort of it's a, a bar. If you're not respectful, you know, then you uh, can't get very far. So another aspect of this story that's quite interesting, and it's, I already talked about it, the um, sort of the, the somewhat secular nature of uh, the protection verse, verses. 
most most Buddhists and and non Buddhists who see this think that protection and and chanting protections because Buddhists around the world do these protective chantings. They think it's something magical, like there's some magic involved, and this is kind of a very Buddhist thing to sort of explain it in a way that is totally secular. Now you might argue this isn't totally secular. We've got a talk of angels in here, and that's totally faith-based because none of us has ever, have ever seen angels. But you know, we could argue that that's our fault that we just aren't in tune enough to see the angels like other people are. But we could also just ap appropriate this story and say it in another way. And suppose, uh, I mean, the concept stays the same, and it's this concept of the power of goodness. You think, well, goodness has power, so what does that mean if you do good deeds, magically good things happen to you? No. Things like this happen to you. You know, like uh, people take care of you. If you're surrounded by good people, suppose a kid is um, in school and he makes friends with some, more, some stronger kids, you know, uh, and then the bullies come around. Well, he's got all these friends who he was nice to and kind to and friends with and other people who respected him. You know, suppose there's a kid who helps some older kids with his home with their homework. Just out of, they ask him for help, or not older kids. So the kid, the, the geeky kid helps the, the jock kid, you know, things like that. I mean, it's a simple idea uh, that good deeds make friends. Good deeds bring lots and lots of good results, both worldly and spiritual. They affect your mind and make you more calm and peaceful. And I think that that is an important, it, it is related to our meditation practice because humility, true humility, not this fake sort of, oh, I'm so humble, oh, I'm such a, you know. We can get very humble, we can fake humility. And religious people are very good at faking humility. Buddhists tend to, um, it's, it's, it's potential, there's a potential to fall into a fake humility. Just by affecting it, you see. We're not affecting, we're not talking about affecting. Only through meditation practice, and that's the, the relationship here to our practices, it is meditation practice that leads to true humility. And why? Because you start to see that you're actually worthless. You see that what I thought was worth this, this body of mine, beautiful, strong, you know, powerful, this brain, this, this mind that is, you see it's all rubbish, it's all garbage, it doesn't really work, it's broken doesn't listen to you, and it breaks down, and the end is just all a bunch of garbage. And you lose, this is like what Sariputta said recently, we had one of his stories where he said, you know, I, I, for, he was accused of hitting this other guy, he said, well, for someone who has a big ego, that's certainly possible. For someone who still has attachment to self, then yeah, certainly possible. Me, I re regard this self like like a, a, a young man or woman who, uh, who was bathed and well clothed, just like they would regard a dog carcass hanging around their neck. That's how I regard this body, that's how I regard this being. And uh, that's where true humility comes from. You start to see that reality is not worth clinging to. Sabe dhamma na langa vesaya. No dhamma, all dhammas are not worth clinging. Indeed, not worth clinging to. And so, through the practice of meditation, seeing things arise and cease, seeing the chaos, seeing the unmanageability, unwieldiness of the body and mind, you let go. You don't suffer from the changes, from the chaos, from the uncertainty. It's not that you change it and make it certain and make it controllable and so on. It's just you stop suffering from it. You stop suffering, you stop attaching. Because you stop attaching, you become more re respectful, more kind, more compassionate, more caring, less angry and vicious and mean and cruel. And as a result, people respect you and good things happen to you. There's no magic behind it. Although it sometimes seems magical because so many little things, you see. You do some good deed for someone and it impacts in so many other ways. Other people see you, your own mind changes, uh, the world becomes a nicer place, and so on. So many small things. And then suddenly it comes back to you and you're, it seems like magic. Wow, suddenly this kid is living 120 years. 
behind the scenes, who knows what's going on, who knows what beings there are, you know, or even not talking about beings, uh, like angels, just in terms of humans, so many different things, in terms of your own mind and how you, the choices you make. People who are mean and nasty tend to make uh, rash choices, and their life changes as a result. So, respect, uh, reverence, these are humility. These are all qualities that we could all learn to emulate. So this is an important dhamma, uh, something for us to consider. Respect is important, the Buddha said. It's so important that uh, it can change your life. It can give you long life, give you health, give you happiness, give you strength. These are the four blessings of the Triple Gem. So by listening respectfully on this occasion, if you were listening respectfully, if you weren't, if you were sitting joking and laughing and making fun of me this whole time, well then you don't get this. But if those of you who are sitting paying respect or sitting listening respectfully to the Dhamma on this occasion, I say Jataro Dhamma Vadanti Ayu Onno Sukhambalang. Thank you for tuning in. Keep practicing. Have a good night.